So, yeah, so we, we, so we make our signature gen and then we split that batch up into three at the moment. So mm -hmm. we're working on some other stuff as well. But um, yeah, we split our batches into three and then we macerate passion fruit in part of it to make our passion fruit gin and we macerate blackberries in the other portion to make our blackberry bramble. And your base spirit, you told me before, is plum based. Plum based. Yeah. Plum based. Oh. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, our, our process as far as making our gin um, is pretty pretty straightforward it's it's different to how a lot of other distillers uh, operate their their gin manufacturing so um, uh, we do a cold maceration with our botanicals in the base spirit for about a week uh, and once I'm happy with how that that's progressed then I strain the botanicals out and then run the liquid through the gin still um, without without any any botanicals in it, so all of the all the flavours and oils and compounds that we want out of the botanicals are in the liquid at that point, and that's what comes through in the gin. So we we found that to be for us to be the most consistent way of, of making a product, um, and it's a, it's a scale, it seems to, to be for us a scalable process. So we can do ten liters, twenty liters, a hundred liters, two hundred liters, and it. It, it works out kind of the same the whole way through so um, yeah so that's your that's I guess you read with that glasses on signature <laughs> the passion fruit and your black, black rose yep. which are beautifully I can actually see it without my glasses on because it's actually got different um, colour printing on the labels which means if I know that if I'm dealing with a red one I'm dealing with a blackberry yeah, we've also and on the on the back of the bottles, then we've we put the colours so that if we're if you're running running a bar or if you're doing cocktails, um, you don't need to actually read what's on the label. You just know that if you've got the white one, it's a signature. If you've got the yellow one, it's a passion fruit, and the oh, red one's a blackberry. I love that because one of the really annoying things as a reviewer is people will say, "Oh, exotic botanicals." Yeah. In case of, yeah, I'm, I'm married to a Southeast Asian. Your idea of exotic botanical may be my idea of something I have with my breakfast. Yeah. You know, the, the, the exotic spices and, and some of that. Because of, yeah, yeah. Because of, yeah, talk to me. Um, also, the suburb we live in has got a large Indian diaspora. Yeah. So, exotic spices. Because of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can go to the local food trucks and hear three or four different subcontinental languages spoken um, all at the same time. And um, do the Indians heading by look at them and going, they go, oh, do you want to be and I said, um, don't go easy on me just because I'm, I'm the white guy and all the Indians give me this really weird look and then proceed to um, <clears throat> blow my face off. <laughs> and my wife looks at me and goes, I told you that was a stupid move. I said, you're my wife, this is part of your job description. And you look at me really patiently and say, I told you that was a stupid move. No, yeah. I don't. I say, you <laughs> idiot. Frequently. Um, so, Okay, the blackberries are sourced locally? Uh, we get them out of Melbourne, Yarra Valley, or Monbog, that sort of area. Yeah, there's a lot of blackberries in that neck of yeah. yeah, so we, so when I was a kid growing up, we, we grew up in um, Ringwood, so the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne at that time. It's not the outer east now, but no, yeah, we, we'd always, mum, mum would have been off the farm, she'd make jam and things like that. So we'd, all, we'd be doing trips up picking berries and things like that when we were kids as well. So. Um, yeah, so we've gone back to back back to those sources for for our blackberries. Um, we have we actually do have some big blackberry patches around here, but uh, unfortunately a lot of them get sprayed. So uh, we yeah we just err on the side of caution with that. And look, we try and do everything as 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 far as most of our production um, is as local as possible. And with the fruit, that's certainly the case. We. For our base spirit, that all comes from from farms that are within you know a, a kilometre or two of, of where we are. Um, but unfortunately, there are some things that you can't get here all the time. Um, for the passion fruit, we've we've used uh, passion fruit from a friend of mine who's got a heap of vines over uh, Talamba, so we've used passion fruit from there. Okay. Um, the the remainder is sourced from interstate. So uh, unfortunately getting it year round is is 
the, the conundrum. So we, our discussions early on were, yeah, maybe you should do it as a se- seasonal type thing only. Mm. Um, but we've the popularity of uh, of the three different flavors has meant that we we're, we're doing them all at the same time all year round. So um, so That's it's really so we use a lot of fr- we use a lot of frozen fruit essentially. So it gets picked fresh frozen and then. Um, we get it delivered, so that's no. It, it also promotes some um, consistency. If you've got all your blackberries from the one part of the season, then you're not dealing with variation in sweetness as the blackberry ripens further and then gets to the point where it's no longer viable. Yeah. So <clears throat> no, I think very very smart, and um, I'm surprised that passion fruit actually grow this fast out. Uh, yeah. No. So we get really really you know, good exposure with sun and, and temperatures at the right time. But frost is the big killer for them, but once they're established, the, the vines, like, in, 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 if they're big enough and they've got enough volume with leaves and so on, they kind of maintain their own little ecosystem, I think. So, yeah, we've, we've tried growing them here and, and we just haven't got through the frost with the, with the new vines. So, mm-hmm. um, but once they're established, they grow really well, yeah, uh, in, in the GB. So, yeah, you'd have to basically have them on the northern side once you get the microclimate right, you're basically home and hosed. North northeast facing and they, they do really well. Yeah. They need to be out of the, the afternoon sun, especially over summertime. Like it's just is too yeah, intense. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, but bumper crops, you know, quite often, so yeah. That's right. My um my parents outside has uh, outside of I always had passion fruits. Yeah. <clears throat> um we had passion fruits in Mel- in Melbourne. We had big passion fruit vine in Melbourne across the back of our garage when we were kids. There's actually bananas growing in Melbourne. I shit you not, there's actually really? a banana crop. If you go to Uni Melbourne, hang on, darling, mm-hmm. where was the banana, full size banana palm at Uni <clears throat> Melbourne? I have no idea, but when we walked past it, the fruit was green. It was, this, this banana palm was easily. It's singular. Four there or five was years tall. Yeah, but it actually had bananas because. It was in close to a northern, on the northern side of a building. Yeah, just and the microwaves were smack on it. Yeah, uh, um, and I've seen sugarcane growing in Melbourne. But, um, One yeah. of our neighbours is growing sugarcane, but he's got his microclimates right because he's also growing that near a uh, near a brick wall, so there's good heat retention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that if you can nail those things, you can pretty much grow anything you want, I suppose. But um, yeah, so we've 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 tried to get things, you know as close as we can to the distillery at, at all times, but, you know, botanicals generally come from interstate and a lot of that is shipped from overseas, I guess. So, um, yeah, we have a pretty simple botanical bill for our gin. We're not doing anything too wild there. Um, London dry style botanicals, juniper, coriander, cardamom, star anise, cinnamon and lime. And that's, that's it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said for doing something I mean, you can either do 10 things really well, or you can do 100 things quite badly. And if you're going to do something really well, you have better off sticking to the 10 things. I mean, huge menus often get a lot of things wrong. Mm. But if you know that you can, like, we're an Asian household, and we know that with me, I can generally do um, a pasta bake smack on the nail, or there's a Sri Lankan fish curry that the kids all inhale by the kilogram, or there's um, Kurenik, the Russian... Um, chicken, mushroom, and, um, rice pie. and rice pie that we make up a big dish like this. And I say, well, there's gonna be leftovers. And the three kids look at us and go, dad, we don't do words we can't spell. <laughs> because there's never any leftovers the next day. So I have to get it because of a bigger pie dish to go through. So yeah, you do the simple things right and you get it right every time. Yep. Well, hopefully, yeah. Oh, I'd say that um, judging by the fact that uh, I've trekked the better part of what 300 kilometres to get here, you, you're certainly not getting things wrong. Um, well, we've we've had some success recently with the London Spirits competition, so that was the brag. biggest the biggest thing so far for us. I mean, we've only been operating as a distillery for 10, 10 months now, something like that, eleven mm. months. So. Um, we sent we sent spirits off to the Australian Gin Awards last year. That was our first bottles that we did, first production run. We sent sent the first two bottles off the production line, um, and we got a silver medal for that at the Australian Gin Awards last year. And 
we we really did that just to sort of get some validation on where we were headed with this with this with the base spirit combination botanicals etc um so the feedback as far as that goes was really good uh and then we slowly with within batches have been just tweaking the recipe for that signature gin just over time to try and enhance some things and bring some rain some other flavors back in a little bit um and we decided with london that we'd we'd send send all three gins over there we didn't do that for the for the australian gin awards we only submitted the signature gin just to see what we what sort of feedback we get so the, um, the first lot was if you you sent it off to find out what the opinion was if you won something it was great if you didn't it was no great loss we 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 just well it, it actually it, it came about because they were offering the tasting notes for the first time for for a while so that was really if they weren't doing that we probably wouldn't have bothered to send it because at, at the end of the day with a new new gin and we we'd had a lot of people try it and a lot of people really liked it but you know it's a it's it's so different um with the base spirit and, mm -hmm. and how we make it so we really just wanted some some validation one way or the other whether it was actually on the right track or not and and that that was the the net result oh, i was dumbfounded when i was scrolling through the list and and saw our name there on i can't tell you i'm just speechless really um you know but and just so i guess you know happy that it we we <laughs> we were doing something okay you know like yeah. it's always I suppose anybody that creates anything for other people to a large degree is always concerned that does anybody actually like it or is it, you know so you know it, it's probably different if you're just doing it for a private thing and you you like it and that's okay but but as a commercial operation when you're starting to put it out there you know mm. <laughs> no i, I we, all, hear you. we all need the validation i suppose so um i think the fact it won an award um I think, in fact, the, I think the fact that it won an award is sa saying most decidedly that it is better than okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, I've got a funny thing. I tried this as before it went to the um, to the awards, and the I turned on. So look, it's, it's fantastic spirit, mm. delicious. You're doing the right thing, but then to go off. I mean, you, I just imagine you've gone through and kids are and I'm reaching certain. I'm getting it right. Why? Well, we picked up a gong. Yeah. <laughs> I think, and, and being new to the industry, we don't, I've never really looked at any of that stuff before. I don't know how many people that aren't in the industry really look at those, you know, the award lists and things like that. So I started going back through and looking at, at what other people have been doing and then, um, and, and the London competition for, for us was to then send all three of our gins off to get, you know, some feedback on, on, on all three of them. Um, with our little tweaks we'd done to the the, the recipe, um, and London's a bit different because they do quality score, value, and packaging. So that's combined, and they weight the different parts of that to give you an overall score. Um, so we the signature gin did really well there. That was we got a I think we placed ninety one out of two thousand spirits worldwide for that with our signature gin, 91 points total um, out of 100. The feedback though was 95 out of 100 on the quality score. So that was the thing that really mm. was was very pleasing. Um, you know, length of flavor, mouth feel, you know, the balance and, and how, the, how the recipe was working, the flavors that they were pulling out of it, you know, all those things which makes it attractive once people try it and you show them how to how to drink it the best way, um, all those things make a difference in, you know, being able to sell it and get it into people's hands. It's here marketing. Um, you're unique in the fact that you have black bottles. Yep. And I take it, black rabbit is because there's a white rabbit that makes beer. No. Damn. Wrong again. <laughs> no, okay. okay. So, so black rabbit came about just by chance a little bit so we came up with a lot of names for the distillery when we were thinking about what we we're going to call it um always been a little bit of a black sheep and black rabbit was kind of fit with that a little bit um but actually just trying to get a name that wasn't already kind of trademarked in some way or being used somewhere else was very very difficult uh, I, I had never thought about it before um you know 
have come up with a name for something that 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 has a bit of a story that sounds good that you know you can market that you can that can become a brand that that people will, will recognize uh, and then okay we've got a list of things that we that we might do and then let's go and put them into the ASIC website and find out who's already had that idea because there's not much new under the sun really um, mm-hmm. yeah so that was really just a, 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 a you know shot in the dark almost that that we wrote that name down and and you got it. and it, it was it was relatively available you know worldwide so unfortunately you can't do what the guy did when um, McDonald's moved into Northern Territory they went to set up shop in Northern Territory and got told oh you can't why someone's already um, patented the name in, in Darwin not McDonald's Burger King no it was McDonald's oh McDonald's went to set up shop in Darwin and got told no you can't why someone already knows owns the right to the name so they had to track the guy down and say, okay, asshole, how much does it take to sell us a name? Because we're not going to come in, into Darwin and being known as McFreddy. Hmm. Well, you know, we've got this multi-billion dollar real estate <laughs> industry. It's McDonald's. So you, you can't quite go doing that. And apparently they had to pay them, I think, a couple hundred thousand bucks or something like that. Yeah, they would have paid. Yeah. So that's just, and, and it's one of those things that you, you know, and I see this with some other distilleries probably not just distilleries but I, because I've been looking at distilleries a lot in the last couple of years I've seen that happen a few times where people people have you know come up with their company name and the distillery name or they've done everything and got it got rolling and then and then they've been sent a cease and desist order or whatever because yeah. they've not researched it out far enough and at the end of the day we I, well from my point of view anyway as a distillery we want to build a brand that's recognizable and and, mm. and builds value and you know all that all of those things and and at some point down the track probably we'll look at exporting we'll look at um you know doing more with the brand and if you're legally on the back foot from the start because somebody else has already got that trademark somewhere internationally or even trademarked here and you just they don't know you're using the name you could run into a massive brick wall yeah, very makes quickly and, very rich well <laughs> it, it, it's not just that it's the it, what goes into actually getting a brand off the ground you know in the past with my other businesses we've just come up with the name or whatever and it's always been something that's very plain jane you know not anything too fancy and and not really any, not any story behind it or anything like that it's just oh what should we call the business arts you know call it whatever and you're not really going to ever be in any situation as a small business operating locally that you're going to find that you're going to get a cease and desist order from from someone who owns a trademark um but Mm. if you're building a brand where you're investing a lot of money into into marketing and brand development and all of those things you you're crazy if you don't do your research on the trademarking and 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 all of that stuff at the start because yeah. it's too much money. I don't I don't know what other distillers distilleries pay for for getting all of that sort of stuff done, but we we probably spent the bulk of our budget on on the on the brand development and, and marketing type stuff, and I couldn't have justified spending that sort of money if we didn't know that it was you know trademarkable and all the rest of it. That's fair enough. I mean, when you when you're being sold in Raffles Hotel in Singapore in you know, six months time. You don't want to go finding that there's a um, black rabbit in Singapore, no. which fortunately, um, boring little Singapore has three distilleries and none of them are uh, remotely to do with rabbits. No, that's good. Um, and Hendrix, I think Australia has already been taken as a um, <laughs> as a trademark, hasn't it? I'm sure it has. Not that you'd ever drink Hendrix. I think we've tried Hendrix a couple of times, and it was pronounced to be boring English swill. Mm. And I think we might have to retry that because we've got so many beautiful Australian spirits, we may need to retry that and see our comparison and how it goes. We're, we're going to do a line of um, doing comparisons. So we'll get gin like yours and then get Hendrix and go, oh, rather than drinking this swill, try drinking black rabbit, which makes it look like, you know, pale English swill that should be better off used as toilet cleaner. Oh. Um, there was actually one woman in the gin group that actually said that she got in the gin out of England and it was that bad. She said, look, the only, she, the only thing she could really justify it was with was, was, was a dunny brush. She said the, she was literally going to use it to clean her toilet. 
because it was well above proof and she knew what you cleaned the crap up properly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, I'm sure there's some, some pretty ordinary stuff being made overseas. I'm sure there's some pretty ordinary stuff being made here as well. But If you lose, I haven't found it. I th- well, I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we, we've sort of we built what we built, and you know, do it do it how we do it. And and I suppose when we start looking at um, you know, black rabbit and the connotations of the rabbit hole and that sort of stuff, the marketing guys had a field day because they they were straight onto onto you know follow the rabbit and you know go down the rabbit hole and, oh, also, and, the and it, yeah and it and it really does fit with what we make because it is so so different you know that that yeah you don't get what you get out of other gins when you drink our gin see they're unique this is the reason why you should drink them and come up to the lovely rural town of Kyala to hassle this guy drink his gins yes yep and sure. Kyala is a beautiful joint with this Thank you very much for your um, your chat. My wife's giving the background going, dude, 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 dude. It's, it's four hours to drive home. Dude, dude, for God's sake, stop talking. <laughs> four, four hours. You must have got lost then. Twice. <laughs> and the worst thing about it, we actually have the GPS. So, so thank you for watching. Um, this will, if it's as long as what my wife is suggesting, this is my like being broken up into three parts. Um, no, no, it's generally wonderful meeting you and having a chat. I look forward to um, making cocktails out of your gins. Alright. Definitely. Yeah. Okay.